现在我们的议程即将开始。这次的议题是 Require JS。那 JS 是一套 Java， 就是 JavaScript 用来解决相异性的工具。那我们欢迎 Davis 来分享一下他使用 Require JS 的经验。好，我们掌声欢迎。Okay, so thanks for thanks for having me back. And this year I was speaking here last year、um, for Yahoo. I was speaking about Yahoo's Mojito framework. And this year I want to speak a little bit about.、Um, How we can use AMD, but more specifically, require JS, and how it can help us to organize our JavaScript code better. So, a little bit about myself. If you didn't、um, see anything from last year, I previously worked at、um, Trend Micro, which is the antivirus security company, and、um, I was the UI engineer on the human interface engineering team. And basically, what I was doing was I was building reusable JavaScript widgets that could be used in all of the products within the company. And then after a while, I moved to、um, Yahoo, which was last year, and I was part of the global search team. And on the global search team, we were building basically products for around 40 countries around the world, and we were building them for like desktop and mobile devices. And we used a lot of HTML and JavaScript and、um, CSS. And then, most recently, I'm now technical director at Ritchie. So Ritchie is a startup in Taiwan. If you're not familiar with Ritchie,、um, basically what we do is we allow you to exchange your loyalty points from different companies. So an example of that would be、um, maybe you are your bank is Taishin Bank, and they give you some loyalty points, but you don't want to use the loyalty points at Taishin because there's nothing to buy. A Taishin. Maybe you want to use your Taishin points to buy an airline ticket, or maybe you want to buy your points to to buy a pizza or something like that. So what we do at Ritchie is basically we allow you to change your different points between different companies, so you can get more rewards and more value for for your loyalty points. So okay, today's talk basically is about the good, the bad, and the ugly of JavaScript. So basically, how do we how do we structure our JavaScript code? And what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to show how how most developers write their JavaScript now. How do they structure it? And then I'm going to look at why this isn't a scalable way. Why why it's not really effective or efficient? And then I'm going to look at the AMD, which is asynchronous module definition. And I'm going to look at how RequireJS can help us to organize our code better, allowing us to develop quicker and to scale better. So basically, what's the problem? We don't build web pages anymore. So on the left is a very old web page, maybe from 1999 or 2000, and it's very simple. It's just a single page. It has simple interaction. Maybe there's a little bit of JavaScript. There's one event handler. Maybe there's a form submission, and that's how we used to write the JavaScript. And then around 2005. Ajax came along, which changed everything. All of a sudden, people were dynamically fetching their resources, and everything got a bit messy because there was really no structure to how we should write our JavaScript anymore. And then, if we compare that to the site on the right now, which is Facebook, you can see they're a lot different. Facebook is not just a simple web page with a few event listeners or click handlers. It's really a complex application which has millions of lines of codes and has hundreds of pages. So We can't really write our JavaScript how we used to on the left for how we want to build large-scale applications now on the right. We just can't write it the same way. But a lot of developers, when they're new to JavaScript, they're still writing the old way, not the way for large application development. So basically, this is your typical page. This is how people are normally writing their JavaScript. So what happens first is, okay, most people are using jQuery or maybe a different library. It's pretty popular. And then after jQuery, jQuery has a lot of great plugins, right? So they'll include their jQuery, and then they'll include all these awesome jQuery plugins after it. And then usually you put in maybe some slideshow, some scrolling plugins, some transitions. And then after that, you're probably going to have like an init script, an initialization script, which will basically link all of your JavaScript plugins together. Maybe you want to init the slideshow. Or you want to register some DOM events, right? So you normally include the init script as well at the end, and then obviously most people put the G at the bottom. But you can see that what this means is one of these scripts depends on the other script. 
but you have to manually make sure that the dependencies are available to you. That means you have to manually maintain and order this list of JavaScript dependencies. And as your site starts to grow bigger, it's harder to maintain. And imagine a new developer comes into your system or your application. He's not familiar with your code. If you have 10 scripts, maybe he can play around with it and he'll know that one script needs to go before the other to work. But what happens when you have 20 scripts or 30 scripts and then you have five developers, 10 developers, they can't all know what everyone's doing at the same time. So we already know that JavaScript tags, the script tags block the page rendering. So we know that when we include one of those script tags, that the script tag has to finish loading before the next script tag can load. So this means that the performance is gonna decrease linear compared to the number of script tags that we include. So things are gonna get slower. But we also realize that not really every JavaScript file is needed when the page is first loading. So what this basically means is often when the page loads, I probably only need one or two JavaScript files. I don't need all 10 or 20 that I've included. I only need one or two. And normally the other scripts, I want to include them when an event happens. Maybe when they, the user submits the form. But on page load, the user's not gonna immediately click submit form. So actually I don't need that JavaScript at the beginning. Same for maybe the carousel or maybe um, form submission. They're not gonna use it immediately. So actually I probably only need one or two scripts, not all 20 scripts at the beginning when the page is loading. Another example could be um, maybe I have a shopping e-commerce site. And what happens when someone goes to a shopping site like Amazon or books.com.tw? They'll go to the URL and they'll get to the landing page and they'll start to browse through the website, right? They'll start to look at all the different products. And then they'll say, okay, this is a good product. I want to buy it. So then they'll click on the product. And then what happens later is when they click buy, they will check out, they will add their shopping cart, they will add the product to the shopping cart. But to do that, I'm probably gonna use some JavaScript to check are they logged in, are they not logged in for the shopping cart. But I didn't need to load that shopping cart JavaScript when the page first loaded, because I know the user's not gonna do that immediately. So what's the point in decreasing the page performance when I don't need it till 10 seconds later? And we also know that multi-page applications, people start copying and pasting the script tags of the HTML. So we saw earlier, there was like those 20 script tags includes. What happens is a new developer needs to create a new page. So what do they do? The page is quite similar. So they just copy and paste everything from the previous page and they put it into the new page. And then they probably add one or two new things at the bottom for their functionality and remove a few things. So you start to get like a copy and paste syndrome. And again, it's not really a scalable way to do things. That's okay for one or two pages, but what happens when we get to 10 pages? Or what happens when we get to 500 pages or 1,000 pages? We can't just cop keep copying and pasting every time. And then we know that the site's grown, so is the complexity. So the 1,000 page site will probably have lots of different functionality. And we probably need to reuse some of those scripts that we included. We might not need to reuse all of them. Actually, for a single script, maybe we only need to reuse part of the script, not all of the script. So we need to reuse parts of it. Sometimes we need to reuse all of it. The use cases are different for every different page, for every different site. And again, you have more developers. And if you're developing one of these scripts or the libraries, I don't know what you're doing. So how do I know what you're writing is going to work with my code when I include your JavaScript te um, tags? So basically, the way we're writing things now is there's no encapsulation or export value. And we all always know that including these scripts, we're probably going to pollute the global namespace. So if I include your script for your library, I'm not guaranteed that you're not going to overwrite something. In my, in my work, in my variables, because you're polluting the global namespace. There's nothing to guarantee that, to stop you from doing that. And there's no reuse or export value because nothing's a module. It's just a script tag that you include in the global namespace. So actually there's no defined result of including your JavaScript file. I just gotta hope it works based on everything else. So people think, okay, Let's solve this um, global namespace problem and we'll use the bad. So we'll solve the ugly with the bad, but we don't want, that's still not a solution. Doing 
bad things just to solve ugly things. So people think, okay, we have an anonymous function and we know anything inside that function is not gonna pollute the global namespace, right? Well, that's right, and you're not gonna pollute the global namespace, but this still doesn't solve the problem about our dependency management. Here, how do I know inside my anonymous function that jQuery is loaded? How do I know that the slideshow is available? I don't know all of those have been loaded. I have no way. I just have to hope the developers included the library manually before this script got called. So while the anonymous function um, protects the global namespace, it's not handling our dependency management. So in Chinese, is basically saying, let's, let's get rid of the old way and do the new way. Basically, we're not developing the old way, single page app where it's just a simple form submission. Everyone's building complex applications now, right? So let's get rid of how we used to do it and let's move on to the new ways to do things. And one of those ways is AMD, Asynchronous Module Definition. And this is pretty much the good stuff that's happened in the last few years. So it's the good stuff, what does that mean? So basically, we write modules and we know that modules are encapsulated and they're sandboxed. So because they're sandbox and they're in modules, the code becomes flexible. I can reuse these modules on different pages. And not only can I reuse them inside my um, application or product, because it's a module, I can give it to other products within the company. So maybe we have a shopping site, maybe we have a mobile application. I can reuse these different modules in different places. It doesn't just have to be on one site. And we also, there's no namespace conflict, and because it's a module, it's very clear functionality, and modules will always return an export value. You'll always know by calling this module, what can you use? What's the functionality and export value? And also we have discrete module access, so this is promoting loose coupling, and we know that a module does one thing and one thing only. And also we can, there's no cross-domain issues when we're using AMD modules, they can load they, do, they can load dynamically without a build process or a server. So that means basically we can fetch remote resources. What happens if I want to fetch scripts from a CDN or from a third party integration, right? I don't have to always have it local. With AMD, it allows us to do this. And the code is structured and clean. So because we have a, a clean code base, um, all of our developers on our team can now develop very easily. They know that or oh, it's very modular. If I want to find the shopping cart, I know where to look. If I want to find the authentication, I know where to look. If I want to find the Facebook like or check-in, I know where to look. It's not just random files. Everything's organized, structured, and laid out. And there's no more of these 5,000 JavaScript files that nobody dares to touch. I think all of us have had the experience where we've included a JavaScript file. It's 5,000 5, lines long, and the developer who didn't write it doesn't know what it does and they're too scared to change it because it might break everything, right? Because everything's modular and broken down, we can now start to reuse each other's work. We can start to enhance each other's work, extend the modules. And obviously, um, we have asynchronous loading and the dependencies are managed. So modules can load in parallel and we're not gonna have the blocking like we do for the traditional page rendering way. So again, we can load things quicker. And because things are modular and the dependencies are managed by AMD, um, basically we only need to use what we need on page load. Remember, we don't need all those JavaScript files, those 20 files, we only need one or two files up front. But with AMD, we can load on demand, we can do that later. So again, we have performance increase, we have some benefits there. But why modules, right? Everyone loves frameworks, right? I mean, you have, you have jQuery, you have Sentia Touch, you have all these wonderful frameworks, so why do, why do you need to write modules, right? The framework does everything for you. Why, why waste your time? Well, basically, frameworks pretty much suck. And there's a term in computing that we use called the inversion of control. And basically what that means is you don't tell the framework what to do. The framework's telling you what to do. And by that, I mean the framework manages the flow of control and the data is managed by the framework, not by you. It encourages plug and play. What does plug and play mean? Well, basically, you didn't write the framework. The application author wrote the framework, right? And he left the gaps for you to use the framework. So you're just filling in the gaps of the application. You're not actually developing it yourself, which means you have limitations later down the line when your site wants to do something special, but the framework doesn't allow you to do it. You're just filling in the parts, right? You're not really developing it yourself. 
And obviously, we know frameworks are really huge and complicated, and they include a lot of stuff that you don't need, right? You only probably need 20% of what the framework offers, but you have to include the whole framework usually. And there's a steep learning curve. So it's just like learning a new language because I didn't write the framework, so I don't know the ins and outs of the framework, so I have to spend a long time to get to know what the framework can and cannot do. And then there's always a nasty bug down the line later on that nobody expected. So why are modules great? Well, basically they have a single purpose responsibility. A module should do one thing, and it should do it really well, and it should do it reliable. And obviously the sandbox, they're reusable and maintainable, and they provide an abstract interface, and they define their imports and exports. So they define, for this module, what do I need loaded already? And then they define, and in return, this is what I'm gonna give anybody who includes me. So they're isolated and contained, and again, we have loose coupling. So to do this, we have an implementation of AMD, and that's RequireJS. Basically, RequireJS was called, um, created by a guy called James Burke, and it implements the AMD specification. So AMD is not a technology. It's just a specification or a set of rules how to implement it. And RequireJS is optimized for the browser, but it can also be used by Node and Rhino on the server as well. And like I mentioned earlier, it can um, handle cross-domain acid fetching. So basically how it does this is RequireJS will use head.appendChild to append script tags to the head. So because you're using a script tag, you're not subject to the cross-domain issues like you are using Ajax. So it'll inject the script tag and it can fetch remotely. You don't have the cross-domain issues that you would have using Ajax. You don't have to use JSMP or anything like that. And the current version is 2.1.6. It's quite mature and it's well, ad uh, well adopted already. So some of the companies using it, jQuery are using it, um, the Dojo, there have been a large um, driver in the AMD specification, and Embed.js are using it, Firebug use it, actually BBC from the UK are using it, um, I think PhoneGap or Cordova are actually using it as well, so it's really mature and a lot of people are using it already. So there's two important concepts that you need to know about RequireJS, and once you understand them, you'll start to understand how the whole thing works and comes together. So basically, we have the function called define. And basically, what the define function does is you're creating a module that you want to be used by other modules. So basically, you're creating a module that can be reused elsewhere. So you can see here, we have define card and inventory. So what we're saying here is we're saying, I need the card and inventory modules to be loaded before the, this function, this module executes. But this module doesn't know if card or inventory were loaded or not. It doesn't care. It's just saying to require JS, fetch them for me. And then when you're ready, pass them into the function with a reference to the variables. So you declare your dependencies that you need. Require JS is going to handle the loading and evaluation of do you have those dependencies or not. And it also uses the module pattern in JavaScript to expose what you want to do. So actually, I'm returning an object here, which is basically a t-shirt module. But I can also do initialization things which keep the encapsulation of this module private. And I only return what I want people to use. So that way I've got good separation of what I need to do and what I don't want people to do with my module. So a little bit more about define. Basically, it has lazy evaluation of the code inside the module and it's only executed what it needs. So what that means is your application is going to load faster. You basically say what you want, and you get a reference to the module up front. But it doesn't get executed until you call it later and you need it. So things are a bit faster. We have lazy evaluation going on. And once you execute the module that you're calling or that you need to use, then all the other calls to that module are cached by RequireJS. So you don't have the performance overhead of having to fetch the module again. RequireJS has remembered it for you. So again, you're getting performance benefits, performance gains, because you're caching things. And basically, you only write one module per physical JavaScript file. And the reason why you have this one-to-one -one mapping is for clarity's sake. You don't want multiple modules inside one file, because then in my code base, which is nice and clean, how can I find what I need? I don't want to have to do a grep on the command line to find magical um, 
function names or things like that. It should be easy, easy for anyone to understand. And then we have require. Require is actually very simple in require.js. Basically, when you use require, you just want to use some modules. You don't want to create a module. So you use define when you want to create a module which can be reused. But maybe you just want to use the modules. You don't want to create anything of value back. So if you want to do that, you use um, require. And obviously here, we're just including foo and bar. And we're just saying, I want to use the foo and bars when they're available. I'm not actually returning anything because I'm not creating a module here. OK, so we have something which is conditional requires. And this is quite powerful because basically it means your dependencies are not always evaluated until runtime. Or maybe you want to load your dependencies when a specific event happens. So on the previous examples, we included our dependencies. And when the dependencies were loaded, then we would execute the module function, right? But maybe I don't know that I need those modules at the beginning. Maybe I want to, um, maybe I want to load the module and then I need other modules later, but I don't know when I need them. So we can, maybe we can react to events happening. So here's a very simple example. We basically, when we're creating this module, we're just loading it and it will return, but it won't actually fetch foo and bar until an event happens later on. A more um, useful example, I think, would be if we go back to our shopping site that we talked about. So we're loading the page, and we want to check out, and we want to buy the product, right? But I don't know, is the user logged in, or are they not logged in? So maybe I can just load the generic event handler to register for the, um, for the click on the product. But then I want to check another module and check, are they logged in, or do they need to register? And based on that, I can then go and fetch the login module at runtime. Or I can go and fetch the authentication module at runtime. Or I can go and fetch the sign up or register module at runtime. So basically what that means is I don't have to load all of those modules because the user might not ever actually do that interaction. If they're logged in, why do I need the register module? I don't have to waste all of that JavaScript included on my page. So I can dynamically evaluate that at runtime in a different require module. So also with require.js, we have inheritance. So modules are great, but JavaScript's great because we have prototypal inheritance. We don't lose that with JavaScript. We still get it. So here, I've basically created, we have a human module. And a human obviously has name. They have like date of birth and things like that, right? And then I'm saying for the human module, let's extend the prototype with male. And male can have maybe some sons and some daughters. And then I return the mail object to whoever's going to use it. So now, when I include the mail module elsewhere, the mail module is already extending from the human module. I don't have to include human and mail where I'm going to use mail. I've already used prototypal inheritance to get it. So I've saved a lot of coding problems that I might have in the future because the dependencies are there for me already. So require.js also comes with some plugins, which are really useful for loading different types of resources, um, which are not JavaScript files. So most people, they only want to execute the function when the DOM's ready. So once all your dependencies have loaded and then the DOM's ready, you probably want to execute the function. So there's a plugin for you to do that. There's also a plugin for um, i18n. So basically, if you're building a large scale site, you're probably going to need to have a multilingual version. So you're going to need strings in JavaScript, right? So there's a plugin for you to, um, to use the translations in your JavaScript. And then they also include a text plugin. Now, since we've moved to Ajax, the old way used to be for Ajax, we'd fetch the HTML from the server and then actions of HTML into the page. But now we probably want to use some client side templating like mustache or handlebars or something like that. So using a text plugin, you can also have require.js to modulize your templates and to fetch them as well for you. So basically, it's going to handle. And it can also do CSS as well. So you can actually also fetch CSS with the text module. And there's many other plugins available if you go to the require.js website. I think there's, um, there's quite a lot. There's some useful, some not so useful. And you can configure require.js. I won't go through all the configurations, but basically you have a base URL. So within your library or your application, you can set what's the root path for all your JavaScript. And um, you have a wait seconds. This is really useful. So sometimes you're going to fetch all these modules, right? But 
sometimes they're going to time out maybe on 3G or a slower connection. So you can say after 20 seconds, consider the fail and don't attempt to load it anymore. And you have URL args. Now this is really useful because we said before when you first call a module, it caches the result, right? But then what happens if you don't want it to be cached? Well, you can basically include something like a timestamp and it'll help you to do cache busting when you call the module later on. And basically, normally for applications, like the site URL is going to be static across all your modules. So inside the configuration, you can pass a configuration to modules. So when I um, initialize require.js, maybe I have a generic configuration um, object and I can pass that object to all of the modules. They can access that and maybe they're going to access like the site URL or some other things like that. Okay, so we also have paths within require.js. So basically what this does, it, not all of your modules are located under your base URL. Maybe they're in a CDN or not. And you have something called path fallback. So what that means is you can say, go to fetch one module. And if you can't get that module or you can't find it, then load it from a different location. And that's great for CDN purposes because I can say, okay, let's fetch it from a CDN. But if it's not available on the CDN, then serve it locally. So you, for, for the people who have access to the CDN, you can have faster HTTP lookup times. But if it's not there, you still have a default fallback, so everything will still work for you. And there's also a configuration called map. So this is really useful when you're developing a large application. So what map does is basically when you require one module, you call the generic module name, but it will substitute it and give it with a different module. It will serve you a different module. So basically, imagine the situation where um, I have a module called some new module, and basically I'm mapping foo to foo 1.2. This example is not really intuitive. A good way would say, um, let's go back to our shopping side. So maybe for the shopping cart, the PM, they've enhanced the product feature, and you went from version 1.2 to version 1.3. So what you're going to do is you're going to say, when anyone calls my shopping cart module, serve them version 1.3. And then maybe you roll out another enhancement of that module. And then you can say, okay, when someone calls this module, serve version 1.4. But then what happens if something goes wrong in production and you need to go back to a previous version of the module? Well, then you can switch back from 1.4 to 1.3 and so on. So it allows, the mapping is really useful for when you're rolling out product features. And there's something called shim. So basically what shim is doing is not all JavaScript files are in the AMD module format. Like for example, backbone and underscore, they're not in AMD style. They're still like in the polluting the global namespace, so to speak. But does this mean that you can't use them as modules? Well, it doesn't with shim. Basically you can say, I want to have a backbone module. And for the backbone module, before you do anything, make sure you have underscore and jQuery available. And then for export, you're saying, I want to use the global backbone, the global backbone object in the namespace. And you're saying when anyone includes the lowercase backbone module, I want to assign the result of that module as the global backbone object. So that way anything which is not AMD style and is in the global namespace, you can still map them as a module name. So later on, you can see in my function, I'm saying define and I'm including the backbone module. And basically this goes to the shim, which is like a relationship manager. And it says, okay, for anything which is called the backbone module, we want to serve whatever the export is. And in this case, the export would be the global object that backbone has created earlier on in your application. So basically there's also something called packages. Now we're developing large applications. Maybe my shopping cart has many dependent applications. And I don't want to have to include all of those modules just to get the one functionality, right? So basically with applications, you can create a folder, which is the application name, and then have all, um, which is the package name, sorry. And then you can include all of the JavaScript files for that package. And it uses a common JS structure. So basically what that means is when you include store, the store module, it will look at main.js. And inside main.js, you can, you can put all of the dependencies for the store package. So when you use store later on, you don't have to include, um, you wouldn't have to include util necessarily later on if you don't want. You could include util inside the main.js and then you can reduce the amount of modules that you need to include. 
Okay, it has multi-version support, so sometimes I want to use the same module on the page several times, not just one time. A good example of this would be an RSS feed. Maybe I want an RSS feed from Hacker News and an RSS feed from Yahoo, but I, d I don't want to have two different modules to do that. I just need the one module. So here what you can do is, basically you can create different contexts, and a different context can have a different variable. So you call the same module, but you have different configurations. So that way you can have an RSS feed from one site and an RSS feed from the other site. They're using the same module, but you're having different contexts and different configurations. And this optimization, so also we said that we know that HTTP requests increase the page loading, right? And now everything's modular. We probably have thousands of modules. So what does that mean? The page is going to get slower. Well, that's okay for development. But when you go to production, you need to be quick. So Require.js comes up with an optimizer, and basically it will minify and concatenate all of these uh, modules. It will do the dependency tracing and tracking for you, and you'll come out with like one or two JavaScript files at the end, which you can use on production. So it's a lot faster in your development environment, and again, you have all the benefits of um, dependency management. And also the last thing I want to talk about is the reactive error handling. So this is really useful. Basically, when a module fails or throws an error, you can hook into the failure. So what does that mean? Well, let's have an example. Imagine I have a stock module, and the stock module gets the real-time quotes from a website, but it fails. If it fails, what happens? Your application completely breaks? Well, you can register, oh, when there's a fail event, maybe I want to load a different module to handle this fail event. So then the user still can use your site. It's not just a broken site because one of your modules has failed. So at Ritchie, we're using Require.js a lot, and actually we're hiring, so if you want to help to build some global product with us um, and have a lot of challenges, then I think you guys can check out a link to our site. We've also got a booth outside, so if you come and visit us, um, we can talk about this more, we can tell you a bit about what we're doing. So I'm over time, so I don't have time for questions, so you can find me after this talk. Thank you. Uh, 谢谢Davis为我们作为精彩的演讲。